I was born and raised in Flagstaff. I've been married for 12 years and I have two children, a daughter that's eight and a son that's five. I am a teacher and my husband, Scott, is in law enforcement. I've been in law enforcement for approximately 10 years. Uh, been a first responder or deputy sheriff for about six years. I worry about him a lot at work. Lots of times he's by himself and backup isn't close. She doesn't know half the stuff that goes on out there and I do that on purpose because I don't want her to worry. Statistics say the next call could be your last call. The date was November 18th, 2008. Kathy has been feeling tired all day. She puts the kids to bed and turns in early. I got home later that evening. I was tired, so I needed to get some sleep. It was maybe 10 minutes after I'd gone to bed. That's when it kind of got weird. Scott falls asleep, unaware that Kathy's heart is beginning to beat erratically. Deep inside the muscle fibers of her heart, a deadly virus is attacking. Kathy started off just kind of, you know, deep sighs. And then she actually started like a snoring. The snoring is Kathy taking her last breaths. She is going into cardiac arrest. It was so loud. I thought, you know, this is kind of annoying. Two or three times I actually elbowed her and she just wouldn't stop snoring. Kathy was sort of doing this sonorous snoring breathing that's very, very common in cardiac arrest. Her heart was still quivering. The heart only goes into this rhythm that we call ventricular fibrillation for a period of time, and then it'll just stop. I was yelling her name to see if she would respond at all. Yeah. There was no response. And once the light got on and I could see her face, it was then I knew that it was her gasping for air. I just reached over and gave her a sternum rub. You take knuckles of your hand and just very aggressively rub it against their sternum, and she didn't respond to that. The first thing that kicked in was all the training that I had received throughout the years of being in law enforcement. Scott can't find a pulse, and Kathy is not breathing. As a first responder, you know what a person looks like when they're deceased. She had taken her last breath. I knew my wife was dead. After the heart stops beating, there's a lack of blood flow to the rest of the body. And as a consequence, there's no oxygen getting to the brain or anywhere else. And the, all the organs shut down. They stop functioning. And that's the beginning of death. Oxygen-starved cells inside Kathy's body begin imploding. Her brain cells are the first to go. I have been trained in CPR. And until that night, I had never had to perform CPR. My first time was, was on Kathy, my wife. I'd seen it performed, and the first couple of compressions, you do hear ribs break. She had like gasped one more time and took a deep breath. And I knew that I had just a few seconds to get to a phone. There are different stages uh, of cardiac arrest. In the very early stages, the blood in your tissues and your brain still has an acceptable level of oxygen and really the key thing is to generate forward blood flow. That means that the chest compression part of CPR is really the predominantly important thing. Scott rushes to the kitchen to call 911. During the time that I was dead, I remember seeing my grandparents who've passed away years and years ago waiting for me and I remember nothing else. Kathy's case, I think, is fascinating. Here is somebody whose heart stopped beating. She had a sensation of meeting deceased relatives. It's almost like they've come to greet her and help her through this process of death. I can't imagine what my husband felt seeing me dead. Blackstab 911, where is your emergency? The dispatcher on the phone, her name is Kim. We've worked together for a few years. She said, Scott, are you OK? And I said, no, Kathy's dead. Where are the kids? Okay, are they asleep? Yes. Okay. You stay calm for her, okay? You stay calm, okay? Yes. Just treat it as you would if you were on the road, okay, love? It's different. I know it is. I know. I know it's so different. Okay. Scotty, Scotty, listen to me.
I know you're scared. I know you're scared, but you've got to calm down, okay? She needs you. She needs you to be in control, okay? How soon? And she immediately was dispatching ambulance crews. She said, all right, you've got to do what you've got to do. You've been trained in this. Hey, Kim, she's blue. She's blue? Start CPR right now. Do not stop. Put the phone down and do CPR right now. Or you know how to do it. You've been trained in it. Get it done. Get it done, babe. I had started CPR. I tried a breath, and I never got any breaths in her. I told Kim I can't get a breath in her, and she said, don't even worry about it. Just do chest compressions. She's like, I'll help you count. Count with me. What compression are you on? Huh? What compression are you on? Count with me. 11. 12. Count with me. 13. 14. 15. Kathy is deprived of oxygen for seven minutes. CPR can keep blood flowing through her body, preserving her brain. A couple of times that I did drop the phone trying to do the chest compressions. While doing them, I could actually hear Kim yelling because she knew I dropped the phone. I felt like I was just out of control. I didn't know what I was doing. I knew I was losing my wife. When the paramedics arrived, everything just turned upside down. Even though Kathy is dead, her heart is still fibrillating. Paramedics hope to shock it back into rhythm. One of the reasons why people die is that their heart loses its normal synchronous electrical activity and goes into a state what's called fibrillation, which is where the electricity is just fibrillating. When we shock people or we defibrillate them, we give them a surge of electricity that goes through the heart and almost resets everything back to the normal state. In Kathy's case, paramedics shocked her heart because she would have had a very abnormal beat. It takes four defibrillation attempts to get Kathy's heart beating again. Somebody finally said they have a pulse. So it was like a whole new world. I was so thankful that they were able to get a pulse out of her. When she arrived at the hospital, she was posturing which means she was kind of like, almost like a seizure. She was stiff-armed or stiff-legged, which shows signs of brain damage. They actually had her in a medical-induced coma. The doctors make a decision to use a relatively new technique of cooling the body in order to slow down cell death and buy them time. They do this by putting Kathy's body on ice. The doctors cooled Kathy's body and lowered her body temperature with the goal of both decreasing her oxygen requirement, her body's need for oxygen, and slowing down her metabolism. If we cool people quickly after the cardiac arrest, we can improve the chance that that person will survive and wake up and have a good neurologic outcome, which is really what we care about. Ongoing research is proving that cooling cardiac arrest victims greatly improves their chances of survival. There are ongoing trials in different parts of the world that are looking at the impact of cooling as soon as paramedics arrive on the scene. So in the future, it may be that as soon as they arrive, while they're doing chest compressions, while they're giving epinephrine, while they're shocking her heart, they're also cooling her immediately. Just under 24 hours, they had actually pulled her off the hyperthermia bed. Once Kathy came out of her coma, everything started becoming real again. I was dead for 18 minutes. When I woke up, I remember seeing bruises on my chest from the actual compressions and the defibrillator. I do remember seeing my granny and poppy, who I've lost. They were there, waiting. They came one at a time, and then they were there together, and I'm sure it was just a short split second that each of them were there. When Kathy's heart stopped beating, there was a lack of blood flow to her brain, which would have caused the release of various chemicals. Now, it's possible that these chemicals mediate what's called a near-death experience. Although in reality, we should now call these actual death experiences because Kathy really died. She wasn't near death, she actually died. It was a pretty picture of them there. I remember what they were wearing and it was right behind them. It seemed like I could have just reached out and touched them. I don't consider it a dream. People who have near-death experiences sometimes feel that the experience is more real than anything that they've experienced in their normal life. And that's why it's very difficult for Kathy to describe it as just a dream. I really feel like 
it was a sign that they were waiting. If it was my time to go, that I'd be there to see him. Even if you call it just a dream, how are you dreaming if your brain doesn't function? The old adage used to be, you're not dead until you're warm and dead. The fact that Kathy was cooled is a very significant finding. One of the things that cooling has taught us is that we can now extend the reversible period of death. Cases such as Sade and Ward demonstrate that people who have died but have been cold have a much longer period in which their death is reversible. There is no moment that we can define as being the end. We know that death is a process and that it can go on for a period of time. As we progress, that time will become longer and longer.